Welcome back to High Performance Computing Lecture 8 on Debugging, Profiling and Performance Analysis. And this is the second part of Lecture 8, where we talk much more about performance optimization methods and tool sets. Based on the initial ideas we had in the first part of this lecture, which was basically learning about debugging in the first place, and then basically also thinking about um, you know, using profiling interfaces of MPI in order to have a better measurement and an understanding how the overall, let's say, application really works, what the runtime is. And once we have these yardsticks, so firstly, we know with debugging, I have an application that, you know, is relatively working okay. It's maybe never 100% perfect. We know that from computer science, essentially, you can never say a, a, a program is 100% bug-free, perhaps, when it's a large program. But still, we can assume that debugging has take place, it took place basically, and then we are very much having a, an application that just works. Once I have done that, it is good to have a yardstick, meaning we can start in, you know, influencing the application logic and make some counters. Counters how often certain application parts have been visited, the different message exchanges we perform, or essentially also having, of course, ideas of the overall wall time or the overall application runtime that we then, of course, want to always decrease because we want to have a lower time to execution in the end with a speed up when I use more and more cores for the problem. So once I have done both of these elements, it is time to think about, can I further improve and tune the application? And this is exactly what we have now in the second part of this application. And also here we will make again the point, as we have seen in debugging with total view before, we need tooling in order to do so, um, especially when we talk about cutting edge high performance computing applications, which really cover perhaps a certain significant fraction of a HPC machine. So here we basically need tooling again, and we will motivate this by really learn a little bit also what's, what's basically the relationships between profiling and performance optimization later. Uh, and so on. And the kind of prerequisite you would really say is once you go into this direction of performance optimization, make sure that all the major flaws and bugs and problems in the software have been basically solved, right? It doesn't mean it makes sense or it, it, it doesn't make really sense to do performance optimization and then basically learn that the overall program was actually not doing the right thing. So you have all your time wasted perhaps for doing the performance optimization, I have to go back and debug. So essentially saying that this is really the, the, the on the top of the stack, you have done debugging, you can profile the MPI application, you know about the runtime and it works, then start the performance optimization. And by tuning the program, we often see in practical HPC applications, you really can enable much better performance by doing so. Um, they are much better speed ups, so you basically reuse really the most you can use from these um, different cores you throw at a problem as best as possible. And while of course a general speed up is always possible when you have more and more cores added, here we're talking about adding them wisely or leveraging them wisely. Use the most of the memory, use a proper interconnection scheme, uh, use a proper uh, message exchanges idea. So don't wait too long and keep processors idle because of course the core hours will be still counting although the processor is idle but still we basically can improve very much with the steps and that's why everyone should basically look at this of course once the general application logic has been done so there are certain patterns even that i will basically finish with we will have a relatively fast walkthrough through this because it's a rather dry topic and of course, the dryness of this is solved by having a really a program like Scalaska that can identify those, let's say, slow executions of codes patterns, which we will then later review. In a way, this is also one of our next part um, of the HPC system software where you already have been conquering a lot of material in this course. So you know the operating system, you have now learned and used the scheduling systems. I showed you several times the idea of using, you know, Ganglia, for instance, at the Utoon cluster, monitoring these systems, health checks. Um, this is all important. And one of the 
other large fractions of tools, Iskalaska, Vampire, and so on, which are really then this performance analysis measurement tools that really help, let's say, um, application developers to much better understand basically their parallel program, but then also tune their parallel program to make the most out of the core hours you have. So this is an important part, again, in HPC system software. And wherever you go, Barcelona, Jülich, um, France, you will find that these systems are actually installed on the machines, whether it's Tau, it's Scorpi, Scalaska, there are many of these tools around. And I'll show you a small video how some of them actually interact later on as a closure here. But of course, um, one tool that is quite nice for this overview that I give you here in a bit more detail is Scalaska. And we will also use the metrics that actually Scalaska can find in terms of the performance problem faced uh, here in detail. But of course, there are different other, um, you know, performance analysis tools, which are cutting edge, like Vampire, for instance, is very much known, um, often developed also in, in Dresden in Germany. And they these days actually work quite good together. So they have common formats. They're working together, these communities, in order to make it more easier for the application developer to use, use these tools really um, from for different purposes. Because all of them, in one way or another, have often a USP, a unique selling proposition, so to speak, why it makes even sense to run many of those tools in parallel. And... The, the key theme they all kind of employ is the automation, right? So we said um, when we want to do high performance computing and we want to do, you know, MPI here, uh, basically, and if there's many, many different cores, then I don't want to do this manually anymore. So usually they measure and then analyze really the behavior of this parallel program. And with this, basically doing the timestamps and every different, let's say, send, receive and broadcast and so on you overall really identify then performance bottlenecks, uh, which we will talk about. It, here's an example. The performance problem here was, for instance, a late sender. So other cores are waiting. Uh, we see basically wait all statement apparently here that here basically the late sender and one of the processes is, is basically, you know, um, blocking all the others from proceeding. And this is meaning, you know, idle times for processes that could otherwise work. And with, uh, in other words, the performance of our application is not optimal because essentially these cores are just idle and not using properly our core hours for, for really computing. So then, of course, the idea using these tools is that you get an optimization hint or a view what is the problem. Um, and, and of course, this helps you a lot when you think about um, the whole stepwise approach in this. So where is it happening? Where in the application? And this helps, of course, with uh, different causes of problems that you can identify. Is it a bottleneck in communication or is it a synchronization problem and things like that? So Scalaska here is one tool which is very good in this. And one of the reasons why is definitively here that you have this kind of metric tour that we will go through the metrics here um, that basically are certain performance problems. You don't need to know them by heart. It's just more that you understand that, you know, early reduce, early scan, late sender, scan will be a new MPI, um, basically, um, function I will introduce today, but it's very easy to understand. And that you then, of course, know where in the program this is actually happening while still seeing also the timing of all these different parts of your applications. It basically plots the time here. And then you know also which of the processes are affected and where in the system. So this is, let's say, one example of those tools, Scalaska, but in one way or another, all the other performance analysis tools have a very similar idea. Of course, they want to show you where in the application is the trouble. And then they could also map that to a timeline because we often have this iterative loops, if you remember, that you also should do for your phishing simulation, right? We want to do some simulation over time and with this, of course, we have there the, the same application logic may be reused several times, but due to parallelization and to do different work sharing or different, let's say, work um, approaches to work on different types of data, there could be, let's say, that one core is much more faster than the other just by luck, uh, so to speak, of the workload. And then basically the others, you know, have a very much load imbalance. 
And then this is essentially a similar problem then that we have to identify. Just one example of that. And when you come to this kind of metrics, you have some generic measurement metrics that you can, uh, I think, by now really understand much better. We are half through the course, even more half of the course. So already had basically the real execution time understood. You know, basically um, the overhead is, of course, something we have to add here a little bit, which means it's really the measurement time. Yeah, so... Once we do profiling and do measurement, of course, we don't execute only. We also measure and with this keep, you know, variables with some data filled in terms of the wall clock time, for instance, but uh, could be also other metrics. You see hardware counters here, um, how much you have been visiting, what region, which function. All of this is a certain overhead to the general time statement. But with this, of course, I'm also able to understand much better what are the problems in my parallel application and why I want to basically, you know, reduce this or change application logic. So this enables us in a way, um, a clear understanding really, um, what is measured in this an analysis steps and essentially um, is something what you should roughly know by heart here. I put therefore a yellow block, while when we go into the so-called metrics tour here from one of my colleagues in Jülich, that had then now the list of all the different metrics and basically all the different problems you face. Um, this is not so important to know all by, you know, by your head. That's why we have the tooling, of course. So when you think now about MPI, distributed memory programming, we can now basically refine this metric. Um, of course, the general structure remain, which we don't look here at visits and hardware counters and so forth. And the overhead we leave a little bit behind as well. We can imagine that for an MPI execution here, I have also several different factors. I would say one factor for sure is the communication. That's pretty obvious. It's important if you have a collective or a point-to-point -point operation. We already heard the MPI barriers and wait all and so synchronization statements in the collective fashions is important to look at. And then of course, MPI IO, we learned in one of the lectures about parallel IO using really MPI IO with kind of concurrent access to files, for example. Also there could be performance implications. And then of course the overhead, so to speak, of init and exiting uh, the MPI environment should be also not neglected because it also costs time to really set up the MPI environment and then close it later. And basically this is the, the general call trees, possibilities of the metrics that we then basically can see is the, is the anchor point really where the problems could take place. And then for OpenMP, we can imagine there's a similar um, idea of a tree. Now we basically leave MPI out a little bit. It's distributed memory, the same with overheads. Here we're talking now about threads and shared memory programming. So there obviously we don't have so much interaction between the different threads. This is rather done through memory where basically um, you have certain elements that could here basically influence the execution time, which is, of course, again, synchronizing OpenMP threads. We have seen we have synchronization statements like in the MPI environment there. Um, every time when we are basically in a serial region and then starting to spawn or basically then fork, right, these parallel regions, there is some overhead with this because the master thread suddenly has to build the team of threads, right, or create the thread teams essentially. And basically then the same is when we have flush directives, um, basically an open MP. And of course the idle threads, um, are basically self-explaining is basically the CPUs that have been reserved for worker threads, but basically are not used. So this is also of course something which could here influence the time basically, which is not directly the execution time because in the end, it's just the, the time spent in idle threads that we also want to prevent. Um, of course, or keep low. Now, to this interesting word called tracing. Um, again, I said we need automation. And now the question is how we automate something which we want to execute in parallel. And the answer to this is that we have a trace um, analysis process. That means you basically um, have lots of measuring, measuring metrics already, like, you know, um, elements where basically 
you have uh, the the number of different um, you know time spent in different functions, but basically you need to, to have this information all together on a timestamp basis. And here the automatic trace analysis process, in a sense, uh, will really enable us by basically you know dumping every little aspect like how many times or when I really have then performed certain, you know, send and receives or broadcasts or basically the application logic. And with this, you have this kind of um, low level event trace for every event that took place in the application, right? So you basically dump everything to a so-called trace file in terms of their whole timing when it was happening in each of the different processors, right? So it's already distributed this trace file. And when you then do the trace analysis and do this analysis in an automatic way, you can really have a high level result here, which means essentially, you know, where in the call tree here, you have a problem. And the things that you've seen in Alaska then, that gives you the operation of saying, okay, I can identify some patterns of inefficient behavior. And, and this is of course, uh, really much more feasible to do this automated process and also in a way quicker than really go manually to all the visual trace analysis, especially if you have a large scale problem, right? To really find this. So um, it also covers a whole event trace. And with this, you basically can also have a certain way of quantification in these patterns. What is the most significant uh, problem you face in terms of parallel performance? So essentially you collect with this tracing term, Right, so that's what tracing is about. You collect all the information about this parallel program uh, in order to analyze it afterwards. Yeah, so there's a certain post-processing, post-analysis that is taking place, and for this you're essentially doing a sort of profiling, aggregating statistics about your parallel program on a time-based fashion. And this brings us to this trace files or to this tracing as a whole. And let's look into this a little bit, how that works from the functionality point of view and how you can actually do this. And here you see an example how you can uh, essentially instrument this. You basically see this program source. It has a compiler, brings us an executable that are things we already know and then have an application, which in some form uses the MPI library. So that is, let's say the step zero, it's a typical general MPI program build and run process. Right, so this is what you already know. So in step one then, um, for doing this tracing, we would start with an application instrumentation. So there's an automatic code instrumenter that you can run, right? In, in, instead of just using the compiler with my program source, I will use now an instrument, uh, an automatic code instrumenter, which then instrumented my executable code with this measurements I need in order to do perform the perfect tracing. So here you have then not only MPI anymore, but this specific measurement li library that you really want to add and use for. And you can imagine, of course, it already alludes to the name measurement and profiling your executable. This is instrumentation technique, which means in other words, you also exploit virtually what we learned in the first part of the lecture today by using the profile uh, you know, standard from MPI itself. And then a specific measurement library is added here. Of course, you have some configuration files um, where you can basically influence um, how much you instrument essentially and, and then dump traces elements. And once you have then this application and you have measured the whole application and created, so to see um, this tracing, um, then you would be a summary analysis, which you can then send to this analysis report examiner. Um, this enables us to have really kind of a unified view, um, you know, at the finalization of the program. You have the summary of the whole analysis. And then basically in all of the summaries, you can then by doing post-processing in a way you can um, basically then really identify the call path in your application and then basically see exactly what's happening at what time uh, where on the system. So essentially it's an important tool set and all of that is automated, right? Of course you compile your own manually, 
but the instrumenter is already automated, bringing you this all automated process of basically creating more or less the summary analysis and the tracing, um, where you basically have normal statistics. Um, oops, it was a bit too fast. Have the normal basically elements, and with this in between, we have of course here this kind of element showing you. It's of course executed as you know for a number of nodes you're running on or MPI processes if you want. And then you basically have different traces of all of these different, um, you know, applications. So this enables us then, of course, to use a parallel trace analyzer, because again, when I do now 1024N processes here, I don't want to do and basically bring all of these traces together, basically manually, right? So hence you have some way of basically creating a parallel trace analyzer that is running, of course, with this again that gets a real proper output for the trace analysis that we then also can then put into our analysis report examiner. So um, this is of course an important part and essentially enabling us the two ways now of, of seeing this, where we have the typical summary analysis um, that we have uh, basically for the parallel program, um, things like times and generally the speed ups and so on and generally, but then the trace analysis will also mean we have per process really a detailed view what was happening. So at what time did an MPI send and receive take place? At what time the broadcast take place? How long did it take? And, and things like that. And with this, in a, in a, let's say, unified view across all the different processors, we really have here a, a powerful tool set now um, that really can basically analyze the, the serial and the parallel event trace analysis of an application. So you know when, what event, so to speak, take place. And uh, with this, you have a good understanding um, what, what you could maybe improve now based on some identification of problems. And of course, um, one has to say one thing um, when you think about this. Of course, this means we add certain overhead, right? I think it's pretty clear that with the instrumentation and all of this time taking elements to perform the measurements, even if you have it perfectly supported with the PMPI, you know, profiling library, et cetera, et cetera, you can imagine that of course, um, the just this um, is already taking quite, um, let's say, uh, you know, time away from the execution of the application. So you can imagine by basically introducing this tracing, it is not the right execution time the application usually would have. So with this, you have also then basically um, um, a kind of way that you basically influence to the worst, basically, now the execution time by adding so much overhead, but of course it should help you for normal runs later without the trace to perform better. And by this, you have to just accept the overhead ones and then basically doing it here. And then the interesting thing is um, what, what you then can say is on the other hand of the scale, um, by, by doing this, um, you have to think about that we now have a parallel program measured and traced and this is very much information. So in other words, in order to digest the traces of all of these different parallel processes, I again need lots of different processes, right? So again, in a way in understanding the parallel application behavior that we traced, we need another parallel application, which is here this parallel trace replay analysis that enables us to really with the parallel application understanding the original parallel application in the first place by looking into the traces. Um, and that this is of course better in the sense than running the official application again and again and again is of course another fact why it motivates, so, so to speak, something uh, we call here this parallel trace replay. You see it's definitely from the wall time, not so demanding. But it means that, of course, you need to have some certain trace analysis before performed in order to do then this parallel trace replay. It's still better than having, let's say here, the uninstrumented execution that is, let's say, the default that you have, so the normal application running and their performance. 
And by doing this trace analysis and then this trace will play, you're still better than rerunning this application and again and again to understand performance problems. And by doing this, of course, let's not forget here, we have also the identification of certain patterns of inefficient behavior as well. So it is just an interesting fact what's standing here, right? So that the replay and analysis of this original parallel code that we have here requires parallel computing too. You see also I'm here using more and more processes and this is required to be scalable too. So by thinking about this tracing um, and having then of course many different performance analysis tools in the past, there was basically a little bit of problems that you had lots of these tools and they were not interoperable. So in other words, it was little triggering ideas about a standard called the open trace format. It's still an active research field where basically um, different tools with many different formats should be now rather sticking to this open trace format, OFT, uh, and then basically, you know, have this different performance analysis tools that also evolved over time. Let's say Scalaska came from Kojak, for instance. Um, you have a Paget format. Um, you have then, of course, the Intel uh, formats here. The Tau is another interesting tool that's often around in Paravay and so forth. So in the end, um, this is ongoing work still, but it's a first, let's say, approach towards having this tracing data in a much more homogeneous way um, available across the different tools, because you can imagine once you're running a tool or an application in parallel that we have just done, and then basically replaying this to do the trace analysis, and then I have to do the whole same thing for instrumentation. So for another tool, I again burn corn hours, right? So the core hours on the machine are very valuable to me. I don't want to do it and use them all for performance analysis, but when I have different tools which help me, then I have no choice. But here by having once, let's say, trace the application to its bone, so to speak, I can analyze them maybe with the different tools together. And that is the idea of this particular um, you know, format. And you see here, the world is quite large in this performance analysis tools. Um, I said score P is basically a measurement infrastructure. Based on this, you can have tau, which is an integrated parallel performance system, but also Scalaska, as I said, is more trace-based as well as Vampire, which is also trace-based. And all of them have their unique um, you know, selling prop uh, proposition. So it makes sense to use and maybe also Periscope for it because it's, it is basically having an also interesting automatic performance analysis tool view and it's scalable. And then the, the commercial tools, of course, as well. Um, and, and all of them, um, when you look at this, you would directly see we already had Valgrind uh, discussed and also Scalaska has some debugging and profiling. So there's quite an overlap between all of these different tools. They do in one way or another all a little bit of a debugging, a little bit of profiling, and then also, of course, the performance optimization. Um, and uh, this is basically all based on measuring, which is obviously then based on many of the profiling techniques we have seen in the first part of this lecture. However, you see here, for instance, um, with the idea it was presenting with the parallel trace that we have a concrete tool, which is also available to us on YouTube, actually, with Galaska, which is based on this tracing technique. Um, we're having a kind of Galaska skin as the compiler instrumenter here that you can use to do then this instrumented executable with all the measurement and all the elements, the measurement library and collect an analyzer that I then have is here the Scalaska scan BD that is enabling then us in parallel to do essentially this kind of analyzing and, and the elements to really bring us lots of details. And then we have many times already saw or seen this Scalaska cube tool, right? Which is then this analysis report examiner where we said what performance problem is existing where in the problem, uh, where in the program is it, and where in the machine is it? So that brings us to this tool. So basically, here's a performance problem face, like the late sender, and then where in the application, the weight here, for instance, or then the HPC topology. And here's another idea how basically all of these tools, in a way, go together. And you see a bit here nicely 
the USPs. That's why I brought also this tool set overview, right? You have this Gopi, um, you know, measurement now, which brings you the event traces in this new standard format where you essentially then can basically profile any of these applications on MPI, OpenMP and hybrid. And once you have this standard format trace, it enables Vampire to do the visualization of event traces. We have here in Skalaska these interesting detection of weight states, which is essentially say, alluding to these patterns I mentioned of inefficient behavior and is also really equipped for large scale. And Tau is another known actually tool for performance database and really strong also as a universal performance optimization tools. And Periscope then also enables your online identification of some of these uh, performance properties, which is more or less fueled by a so-called runtime interface then. So all of them have a little bit different idea how you actually use this, especially if you think about pure event traces or called path profiles, which is, you know, enabling then here with this cube to really see a little bit, um, you know, where exactly we are in the uh, basically in the HPC application. So this gives you the overview of these different tools. And the general idea we want to also have to look at is some common problems, right? That people are do using when they do power programming. Here, of course, you could have weeks after weeks of lessons learned and an experience shared from uh, experienced developers. And you find different examples, even of the lowest scale, you would say here a simple loop has in a sense nothing to do really with power computing, but already here you can make errors when you have an outer loop and an inner loop and where you have the index here, just wrongly put that basically the, the first index is always the outer loop. Um, and, and basically this is a correct behavior, but basically people sometimes use just the inner loop for essentially the, the overall array index here. This is much more efficient because you think that in the in the smaller array, how it will be executed, you basically always access the same array uh, you know, in the one dimension and then move just in the second and do something with it. So automatically with this, let's say, memory access here that you have in this lowest performance level make, for instance, already a big impact. If you think now that you're scaling these loops, maybe 2024 processors, to half a million processors, or even maybe in the future with Exascale, we will be always talking about million of processors used. <clears throat> and by using those tools, um, you see here one example of a so-called SVM support vector machine in parallel that we analyzed, that we took from some AI developers, which obviously are very good in AI, but not so good in power programming. So we used the code and we optimized it with this, let's say, a uh, problem that you see here, so SVM initialing, um, parallel solvers, uh, basically I here executed. And you see here several different performance problems that we actually found and then could actually look in the source code and do some performance optimizations. Here's a very good example that, you know, basically we identified that the um, developers here of this PSVM obviously that, that basically were also then without optimizations, not really scaling. You see here, we had already memory access problems with 64 cores, so we cannot go higher. And, and basically we really, whatever we did, we had no chance to, to really get hold of that. But in, in terms of speed up, we basically here have already an optimized version then, which was our version scaling finally better. And, you know, basically it's a very tricky problem, this SVM, so we cannot scale extremely highly, but still at least we could scale much better than just 64. And this was basically due of using this tool set together with the application and then look at basically these problems. And when you look in these problems, you see a, a very common problem um, that, for instance, say you want to have information to every other pro processor or process really in MPI and basically distribute your own part of the problem. And here there's an application um, that basically beautifully, instead of going through a loop and do MPI broadcast in a loop for all these processors, basically you just use MPI or gather instead. There's already an MPI and you have just one line instead of this loop going through the loop and then do collective operations again and again and again. Here you have just one collective operation trigger that does actually the same. 
uh, you know gather already, which was of course getting all the information from all other processors. And the all here just suggests basically it is done for all of them. So all of the processors gather, so to speak, the other parts uh, from all the other processors. So there's no need for distributing them via a broadcast again and again and again. This application does it directly. And then also here, you can imagine we think here about going again through a loop. And here we had found a broadcast, which basically all other processes again get the data. But here, basically, I don't want to only get the data. I also want to do an addition or want to do something with the data. And with this, of course, I can also use the reduce operation that you already know. And because I wanted to do with everyone, I basically use the MPI or reduce. And, and these are examples of how to improve the performances. Things like very simple, you see, instead of one loop, MPI broadcast, I do an MPI all gather. This is good usage of MPI collectives because in each of the collective operations is a certain overhead to execute. And the same I already was alluding to here, again, going through the loop, doing something with the buffer and then broadcasting the buffer and then basically do an operation with it. Here we can then use all reduce quite nicely with the sum here and the MPI sum you know already. And it's basically um, often a cause here, really what I have as yellow block that basically use people use the collective operations not as they should be and adly, adding lots of um, you know um, loops which are basically not necessary. And this brings us then to this matrix tour. And admittedly, I go through this now a little bit faster because I think here it's not the learning experience that you know them all by heart. It just should give you a demo or a short idea that there are really a lot of problems that can be automatically identified, um, which is basically here in the communication collective part, um, then this early reduce problem. And all of these names already give you a hint of understanding this. That's why I go a bit more faster, but they also apply to other operations. But here you see essentially before anyone can really start the route is starting here very late. Um, causing waiting time for other operations. MPI scan is a, another MPI operation you don't know already, but it enables you, for instance, to do a partial sum like I illustrated here. Now, basically the MPI scan will go from process to process with increased rank and always take the sum until this process. So you would see zero here at the process zero. We sum it up with the process one gives a one at the end. Then we sum it up with process two, which has actually a two inside. So we have three added, and then process three has basically a three here. And when I sum it with my previous, I have a three plus three equals six. So this MPI send, and also here, an early scan problem. Um, you see definitely the waiting times across these ranks because they're depending on each other, right? Um, that's the point here. And with this, you have the same problem, of course, with the late broadcast that you sent. And all of this could be, let's say, spent time on something else because basically the, the broadcast is just, just later triggered. And if you move through all of them, they share the same pattern that basically um, here you have an n times n problems that the wait and the all reduce is again, um, you know, the time spent waiting in front of synchronized operation is also something where you have in performance impacts, what you can improve. And then now the completion problem is on the other end of the scale, uh, where you have then basically also again these these waiting times, again which you want to remove on this end basically after the operation has been done, and you just want to synchronize it at the end. Of course, here then point to point um, operations from MPI, uh, of course also they could have a wrong order, same source, different sources, or you have even a late receiver. Um, playing a little bit also with this kind of non-blocking and blocking operations that you already know. And I was sending you, having basically shown you the late sender problems already here and there, uh, which you see here, here's a receive operation. We wait and all of this is, let's say, waiting time, which is wasted as an example. And this is a non-blocking scenario here. In the blocking scenario, you could have the same point of view and a different types of late sender problems. Here's a GAN one where you have the receive operation and then you wait a long time until this MPI send is actually then actually performed. And this also helps us to understand that here we can maybe improve also the application logic a little bit. 
I mean, first it was a late sender problem. Another, um, you know, example of how you can put it together with different statements. Here we have an MPI weight statement then that is also then, you know, quite an interesting problem in this particular scenario where they have to the receive and then the send operation. It is really depending on, on different application logic, what you can improve then there, but at least you are hinted at what you see here, that here seems to be something um, of a troubles and you move to this and you have even the information where in the system it is. So the late receiver problem, um, again, I go a bit quicker through this. I guess by now you get the story. It's mostly about the waiting times, right? This kind of thing, which could be prevented if you maybe have a bit more balance in the uh, load of these or so forth in the you know, programming. The so synchronization is the same problem, of course, um, we face here and there with MPI barriers. It's a collective operation, if you remember, um, be basically waiting all here in front of a barrier until the last process really is reaching it. So they are waiting since a long time, which is wasted. And of course, they have the completion problem as well. Um, with, so it's basically similar elements. And when you go to OpenMP now, shared memory, remember, so here the world changes a little bit. But of course, you have the same problem of this barrier synchronization, um, which explicit or implicit cause waiting times here. You notice also, I don't have here really yellow blocks. I will not ask what is the barrier problem in an OpenMP or so, but the general idea should be understand from you that of course, the patterns that you see here can be nicely identified from, let's say the toolings we talk about like Scalaska, uh, for instance, to really understanding this and we have seen critical regions here or sections are important they will do a lock on a certain part and to release a lock and acquire the lock of course here could be also performance issues because essentially when we have critical regions you remember all other threats wait to also go into this critical region and this could mean also lots of idle time so threats we want to avoid finally on the hardware level i would have of course also in mpi io several elements where I have to look at. Here we now shift the view from the computing and message exchanges really to the wire and how it is actually dumped to disk through the network AO um, parts. And I think you can go on and go on, but I think a video, a short one that you see here from a colleague at Supercomputing 2015 really sums it up much more nicely. I can put on 100 slides, if not 200 slides. So let's have a short look on the video before we close today resources it's consuming and where its performance bottlenecks lie, then our tutorial on practical hybrid parallel application performance engineering may be useful for you. In this tutorial, we will present live demonstration of HPC performance evaluation tools that include SCORPI, the instrumentation toolkit that allows you to generate profile and trace data files. We use Scalaska to analyze these trace files and search for patterns of inefficient behavior and generate performance properties that can be stored in call path profiles. These call path profiles are then analyzed with Tau's Paraprof profile browser or the Cube profile browser. We also feature interactive trace visualization with Vampire in this tutorial. To give you an example of these tools, here is the Cube Profile Browser, where in the first pane, we see what kind of performance metric was collected. This shows you data from Scorpi and Scalaska, where we see metrics such as time, the number of visits, and performance properties such as weight at barrier, late in receiver. The late receiver bottleneck is a performance property that occurs when a send operation is blocked until the corresponding receive operation is called on the other process. And this pattern refers to the time spent waiting as a result of this situation. This is the time the process could be doing some useful work. And to see where this occurs in the source code, you can look at the call tree and follow the call path. It shows you the location of the bottleneck 
and we can see in the third pane the system tree where it occurs on the machine so you can expand a particular node and see which rank was involved with this performance property we can also see the box plot and the system tree other tools such as paraprof can show you the profile files here i am looking at a profile output let me unstack the bars and click on a color which represents a function Here is the name of the function and we can see how it performs on all the mpi ranks if i click on the mpi barrier i can see how it how much time was spent in mpi barrier this is the 3d visualization provided by paraprof <coughs> where i can see the mpi ranks along one dimension i can see the names of functions along the other and the height metric can represent the time spent in the function exclusively i also have panes that allow me to cross hairs which allow me to see which function is involved here i see a bar plot and i can zoom in to a given location and see the thread that is involved here i can see that the loop in this function on rank 199 took 129 seconds i can see the shape of the profile in three dimensions this is the paraprof profile browser we will also demonstrate the vampir trace visualizer which shows you exactly what each rank and thread were doing along a timeline so we can zoom in to a given segment of a timeline and see what was going on in the application so we see a wait and an mpi i send operation over here here is another example where i can zoom into a section of the timeline and see exactly what each thread each open mp thread was doing if you are wondering how we instrument the codes there are various ways to do that here is an example i can build an application say the nas parallel benchmark and instead of running it in the virtual machine like this i can simply add our exec dash d score p and when this executes i'll generate performance data and analyze it in paraprof or cube so i can see exactly how much time was say spent in mpi receive on rank 0 which is 2.4 seconds or launch vampir directly on the trace files thank you okay so i think that gives you a much more lively demo than my long slide set could actually ever been provided to you you have seen there lots of tools but in one way the score p enables us now to really use uh, different tools for different problems really together and with this can really perform much more um, performance improvements really to all the different applications and it's powerful tools that maybe for your fishing application is not really necessary but once you go really to 1024 and more processes then it's really necessary to have these tools so that's all i could leave on the table for you within the time frame in this particular lecture obviously in the centers they have let's say tuning workshops a whole week with applications you have much more you know elements to learn basically for all the different tools and their unique selling propositions but it gave you a good impact i think here and walk through to some of those tools and we will cover basically gpus next in lecture 9 and see you then